The cohort study is another analytical study designed to find out the relationship between exposure and disease. As we have seen briefly before, a cohort study will approach the study question from the exposure side of this diagram, whereas the case control study will start its query from the disease end of the diagram. At the beginning of the study, the investi uh, investigation team will identify a defined population first, and then measures the baseline characteristics, exposure and disease status of the cohort members, and then they will remove the cases from the initial stage. And after that, non-cases are followed forward in time in case of prospective core study design until one of the endpoints, um, which we will talk about later in more detail. So, um, you know, when um, the direction of inquiry goes parallel with the actual sequence of event, then this is um, kind of a typical um, prospective course study design. Um, here we have a kind of a cartoon depiction of prospective core design. So we have, um, you know, Sherlock, um, our disease investigator in 2018. And let's just, um, you know, imagine that we started our prospective core study uh, in that year. And the first thing uh, we need to do is to find the proper cohort for the study. And once you do that, then um, you're going to divide this cohort up into um, two groups by examining their exposure status. And then let's say that you completed this examination in 2019. And now you'll follow them up into 2020 to see what happens. Some people will develop the disease or not, and you'll estimate the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So when people talk about cohort study, they typically mean a prospective core study where the data are collected as they become available during the study period. But you know, cohort study can be retrospective where previous exposure data are already um, available for a defined cohort. So in either approach, however, the subjects are divided solely based on their exposure status, and that's where uh, you know, both uh, investigation um, initiate their um, study. And this kind of um, uh, study design is uh, particularly useful for unusual exposure or occupational exposures. So here we have our Sherlock again in 2020, when everything has happened. Now he wants to start his investigation to see what happened to this cohort by jumping back in time, uh, 2018, when nothing happened. Um, please note that he's still in 2020, but at least the record goes back to 2018, when nothing happened. And he will try to identify the cohort at the time from which the cases arose, but was initially free of disease and at risk. Then Sherlock again uses whatever records that are available to determine each subject's past exposure status in 19, uh, 2019. And once exposures are identified for each member of the cohort, then he will trace them to find out what subsequently happened to them based on their exposure status uh, in 2020. So like the prospective design, retrospective cohort studies are also considered longitudinal because investigators examine health outcomes over a period of time. So the main difference between the prospective and retrospective cohort study is that in retrospective cohort studies, all the cases have already occurred and exposure information is available before the investigation. 
On the other hand, explosion information is collected at the beginning of prospective course studies before any subjects have developed any of the outcomes of interest. And the at-risk period begins after baseline exposure data are collected and extends into the future. So here are some differences between the prospective um, versus historical cohort study. So in prospective um, cohort study, the study begins uh, by defining the cohort and the exposure status of the healthy cohort. On the other hand, um, the record of the cohort's exposure and disease status already exists for the historical cohort. And in prospective um, cohort study, and the study follows the healthy cohort in time for the development of disease and takes a relatively long time to complete the task, um, to complete the study, especially if the disease is a rare or has long induction. However, the historical cohort study uh, takes relatively quick to complete because no follow-up is actually required, right? Uh, because um, everything is already um, happened. Um, so all in all, the main difference between these two types of study lies at the point in time when information on exposure was collected, present or past. So then how is a case control study different from a retrospective course study? The main difference uh, is really coming from where in the disease development each study designs start their study question. So for a cohort study, and the historical cohort study, well, regardless of a retrospective or prospective, the study question always begins at the exposure status of the group under investigation. On the other hand, a case control study will start from the outcome end and try to figure out the potential exposures. Um, there have been only a handful of big cohort studies in eye care conducted um, in the world so far, predominantly in the developed countries. And one of the uh, most current cohort studies in the field of eye care called the Nakuru cohort study is uh, driven by the UK researchers, which is probably the first one in Africa. And this was initiated in 2014, which had been extended from the previous cross-sectional survey in 2007 in the same region of Kenya. As we learned previously, cross-sectional um, study plays a pivotal role in providing prevalence information on causes of um, disease. And in their case, it was blindness. While this information has been vital, in planning services where resources and provision of healthcare are very limited, data on incidence and rates of progression of eye diseases are needed to allow long-term planning for Africa. And by the time, no longitudinal population-based studies of eye disease have been undertaken in Africa. So um, by now, the study should be more or less completed um, as it was originally planned for six years. And in fact, it is a very interesting study, um, well equi equipped with um, technologies, including the mobile application of visual acuity testing and portable alternative to ophthalmoscopy. So um, for more information, I strongly recommend that you watch this TED talk in 2014 from the very director of the study. So here is the um, very short summary steps in conducting a prospective cohort study. So for common risk factors such as smoking or drinking, uh, investigators may enroll a general population cohort such as Nakuru cohort. With a general population cohort, a large number of common exposures can be considered for a large number of outcomes. Once you have your cohort selected, then you need to collect baseline measurement of exposure. 
Um, these can be collected from the previous records um, collected independently of the study in case of historical cohorts, such as medical or employment records. Um, or information can be supplied by the uh, study subject themselves, for example, through like personal interviews or questionnaires. Or their uh, exposure status, uh, the baseline exposure status can be uh, measured using direct medical examinations or testing. Um, once you have your cohort determined and then finish measuring their exposure, you need to select a comparison group among the unexposed. So the ideal comparison group would be a group that was exactly the same as the exposed group, except that they would be unexposed. Uh, this is um, referred to as the counterfactual ideal because it is impossible for the same person to be both exposed and unexposed at the same time. Consequently, the best we can hope for is to select a comparison group that differs with respect to the exposure of interest, but is um, as similar as possible with respect to other factors that might influence the outcome. So there are two key things that are essential um, in selecting the comparison group in a cohort study. The comparison group to be as similar to the study group, and secondly, the information collected to be as accurate and comparable to the study group. And once you uh, determine uh, the exposed and unexposed groups, then you can follow them up to identify an outcome. Now you're halfway done, and uh, now you need to follow your cohort in time and wait for an outcome. Needless to say, it is crucial to retain as high proportion of people in the cohort as possible to minimize selection bias. Uh, this will become particularly a problem, especially when there is a differential loss to follow up between the exposed and unexposed group. In many um, instances, subjects in the exposure group are more likely to be lost to follow up once they develop the outcome or disease resulting in the underestimation of relationship between the exposure and disease in the case group. So you should make every effort to stay connected with the cohort members by either calling them or emailing them periodically or paying a visit if necessary. However, um, sometimes it is just unavoidable to prevent someone from dying or people just have to move out of the cohort because of the job relocation, for example. Or people simply lose their interest in participation. In any cases, you need to have a clear set of rules should the members of the cohort stop participating. So in a long-term prospective core study, each uh, member of the cohort is followed up until one of the four end points. So the first is the end of the study, right? Then this member is stopped follow up. I mean, obviously, right? And secondly, the person is followed up until the onset of disease. So when this person becomes a case. And thirdly, when the member of the cohort is dead. And finally, laws to follow up. Okay, so these are the four end points um, that a person is followed up within the, uh, the period of the study. So once you have enough outcomes during the follow up, and the first step in the analysis of a core study is to measure the incidence of a disease in the exposed and unexposed. So for a long-term prospective cohort study, instead of an incidence proportion or risk, another type of incidence measurement called incidence rate is introduced to take directly the time information into the denominator. <clears throat> 
So let's imagine a situation where a group of initially disease-free people are followed um, <clears throat> for a period of time, then we can determine the proportion of a people who develop a disease at some point during the follow-up period in order to arrive at an estimate of the probability of developing the disease, right? And this probability is basically the working definition of a risk. However, this approach is a bit too simplistic to define the true risk of disease, especially to assess the long-term risk because of what happens during the follow-up, as we just have seen. First, there can be um, competing risks that might result in the death of some members of the group before the follow-up period ends, making it um, you know, difficult, if not impossible, to know whether they would have developed the outcome of interest if they had not died early due to the other competing risk. And the second problem is the loss to follow-up. So it is inevitable and getting more prob uh, problematic as the follow-up period is longer. And finally, the incidence proportion does not distinguish the time at which the disease occurs as long as it occurs within the follow-up period. For example, if a population is followed for 20 years, it would make a difference to the person and to the epidemiologist if a disease um, such as cancer occurred after two years or after 20 years, right? But both of these outcomes would count the same with the incidence proportion.